Step 4. Rule sets in qRNA. So how do rule sets fit into the picture of qRNA that we have painted in the previous step? We have seen how rule sets are generated in a two-pass connection setup when this is used within a network. This is the image that we had in mind. The initiator creates the connection request, it writes down the responder's address, the output states, the fidelity, and the number of bell pairs that are required, and sends it along the path towards the responder. At each node along the path, we append the link specs for that particular link. Once the responder receives all this information, it generates the required rule sets, keeps its own rule set, and sends the remainder of the rule sets down the path towards the initiator. However, this strategy only works at a single layer, so we need to generalize this to multiple layers. This is going to be the basic strategy that we're going to use. At every layer, the request is given a responder address. So there isn't a single responder, there's going to be multiple responders, one for every layer. Then the next hop will be determined by local policy. Then we recurse until we hit the physical layer, and then we send the request to the neighbor. So here we start at layer K, where we have the responder address, and we've got the current node address. Those addresses must be translated using the map function, which we introduced in step two when talking about um, recursive classical networks. And we recurse into layer K minus one, where the map function produces a new responder address and a new node address. And each network's responder constructs the rule sets. So now the rule sets are not constructed in one central node like before in the responder. Now, we, because we have multiple responders, we're going to have multiple nodes that are actually generating the rule sets for the entire connection. And they are distributed backwards along the path in the similar way as for mm, the single, single layer rule set distribution. And once the um, connections, connection request reaches the final responder at the highest layer, uh, that responder sends back a confirmation of the connection. Let's see how it works with, with a few pictures. Let's say that our client in network one, given by this node, is the initiator at layer k plus one. And the client would like to engage with a quantum server which is the intended responder at the same level, which is located in network two. The client cannot directly connect to the server, so the client recurses to a lower layer, lower k. At this layer, the address for the, for the client, for the initiator, is 1.1. And we know that we need to go through a route, border router at 1.99. This is for network one border router for network 2, given by the address 2.99, and finally we reach the new responder at this layer k, given by address 2.1. So the node 1.11 knows that the net next hop towards 2.1 is going through this router at 1.99. And this can be looked up in the routing tables at this layer. So, the node 1.11 runs the map function. The current node address, or the source, or the initiator address is 1.1, and we, the destination at this layer is 1.99. The map function produces a new set of source and destination, or initiator and responder addresses, given by 3.1 and 3.99. And then we run the deliver function. This deliver function tries to uh, pass the data from 3.1 to 3.99. If the map function fails, then the connection fails, because we don't know what are the new addresses for the initiator at the lower, lower layer and the responder at that layer. Similarly, if the liver also fails, then the connection fails. This is very much like IP packet translating down to Ethernet layer. In picture, this is what we just talked about. 
1.1 translate its own address into 3.1 and the new responder address is given by 3.99. At this layer, we've got an intermediate node along the path given by a repeater node with the address 3.2. Here, when the deliver function is run, the request is sent from 3.1 to 3.2, from 3.2 to 3.99. There, the new responder is reached and we can go move up a layer back to layer K. Notice that over here, when we are in the network one, we see this entire process. We see the address is 3.1, 3.2, 3.99, but we do not see what's happening in network two. In fact, network two, a very similar process is happening as well. The router 2.99 is translated into initiator 4.99 and the responder 2.1 is translated into responder 4.1 at a lower layer k-1. In this particular example, both of these layerings are symmetric between network 1 and network 2, but in principle, there is no need for this to be true. They can be just as equally asymmetric. For example, if there's further layers in network 2, then simply 4.99 recurses and moves down one layer and we run the same uh, map function again and the same deliver function again. So once, once the request reaches the final server at uh, this responder over here, the highest level, uh, connection confirmation is sent backwards. Also, the nodes, as we said, that generate the rule sets are the responders. And at this layer, at k minus one, we've got two responders here and here the border routers 3.99 and 4.1. They generate the rule sets and send them back along the path at layer k-1 towards their respective initiators. Also, the rule sets need to be rewritten at nodes 1.99 and 2.99. This is in order to hide the details of the path along the connection from, let's say, 1.1 and 1.99. Network 1 does not want to reveal all the link specs for these corresponding links at k-1 layer. So it rewrites the rule sets at the boundary router to make appear this uh, link 1.1 and 1.99 as a single link. Similarly, Network 2 does the same thing at border router 2.99. Benefits of using such recursion at boundaries and rule set rewriting are the following. It limits the amount of information each node requires about the entire internetwork. The less information nodes have about the network, the more scalability the whole architecture possesses. And that's really one of the main challenges that we have to face. That's how to scale uh, our protocols to global level. The second benefit is that it allows responders to innovate within bounds of rule sets. What this means is that maybe one network has one way of writing rule sets, but if a better way appears, then the responder for that network can use the new better way of writing rule sets and optimizing performance of that network. Three, it allows for effective reasoning about connections. Four, it acts as a convenient point of 1G and 2G interoperability. And more broadly, it facilitates interoperation between different network architectures. There is no need that network one and network two both have to be 1G or both have to be 2G, or in fact, both have to use the same network architecture. Benefit number six is that it naturally allows for privacy and autonomy by hiding the internal network details. Remember, this was one of the desired features of a repeater network uh, architecture. That's the conclusion to how rule sets fit within the framework of the qRNA, and also the conclusion of our block of lessons about networks.